So today we have uh, two person on our talk. We have Benoit. Hi. Uh, it's the person behind uh, uh, Artisan Developer and Scott, uh, the, a coach, Agile coach. Uh, can you give more about him? Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I. Uh, I've done lots of large projects and uh, lots of enter large enterprises. So uh, in the health service in uh, Britain, many of the large systems that we put in. And uh, now I work in the financial sector. So I work with lots of large uh, financial sector organizations. Um, working, um, currently working with the engineering uh, part of a bank to uh, help um, with their culture and their flow and their attitudes to uh, developing uh, software that the customers want. He's also heading the Agile Scotland stuff, the herd of Agile. Can we say Agile Pirates? A Be More Pirate is the uh, Be More Pirate is the uh, the Agile movement. Yeah. Good. Okay, I understand. You do behind Agile Pirates. Okay. I see it. Benoit, can you present yourself a little bit more than what I did? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so I'm a software developer for the last 20 years. And um, since two years now, I've been involved in the project Artisan Developer, who, whose goal was to, to share passion about code and to share craftsmanship values, skills, and techniques, in particular in France and all French-speaking countries. Okay, so uh, I was proposing to invite uh, Benoit for uh, having a chat about uh, this morning about how to bring uh, craftsmanship or DevOps, all these technical, um, um, let's say, technical things uh, into um, agile teams or, or just in teams. How's he making that, uh, um, let's say, how to make that all these teams think more about bring quality? Because if we look on, on the description of Agile, quality is not a viable, it should be fixed. Uh, the manifesto is with plenty of things about quality. Um, oh yeah, there's a, a few principles about quality. One. One. One for one. sure. Oh. Yeah, principle number nine is about quality. Principle number 10, simplicity, it's about quality too. Uh, no, simplicity. Oh, yes. It's quality too. So there are <laughs> many things too. No, he's joking. He's joking up here. Um, so what would be the, your point of view on it? Because I, um, I don't know how it's going uh, in France or in, uh, in Scotland, but uh, back in Switzerland, it's starting starting to have uh, executive or managers calling and say, oh, I feel we have a problem in the company. Both developers care more about value than quality. Uh, to, 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 about uh, this? Uh, for me, it's a, it's a bad excuse. So what uh, I always see is, so when you're meeting the executives, they always say, oh, developers are not doing this, they're not doing sloppy work, they're not organized well. well. And in fact, when you're going dive quite deeply into it, you just see is a lack of uh, uh, vision, a lack of strategy is uh, do everything would I ask you to do and do it fast as, as soon as I, I expect them. So it has usually nothing to do with quality. quality can, a lack of quality can be usually a consequence of bad, uh, bad prioritization or whatever. So I, I do really believe that software developers that want to do very well work, that want to work on quality. And having a bad quality is usually a consequence of bad communication or a bad behavior in the system. That's for my sake, sorry. Benoit? I'm, I'm not sure to understand what we are looking for. Are we looking for an explanation of bad quality? Yours? No, an explanation about uh, why why now companies, or no, I'm going to say, explanation on, yeah, why is bad quality? Why companies start to think, oh, but we have a problem of quality in the product. In the product. Oh, because things accelerate. 
before agile, you could, you could have months or years in front of you. I mean, it was not a problem. You have one release a year, so you have time to make tests, to fix bugs. But when switching to agile, things go much faster. And, and, and I feel like it, more, it push more pressure on quality because if you don't bring embedded quality, it will be really, really painful and visible. So the acceleration of the world, I mean, it's not because we adopt Agile. Agile is a response to the complexity of the world, I mean, from my point of view. And you have, when you go, when you, when you drive faster, you have to have good wheel and good tires. Otherwise, you, you don't stay on the road. Yeah, I, I think this is to do with power. Um, I spent a lot of time empowering teams to say no. In fact, one of the things I say is if you can't say no, you can't say yes. Okay. Um, one of the things I've so so let's look at this, let's look at the other things. Oftentimes, developers want to um, do things in a quick way that is an interesting problem, um, but what they don't do, want to do is sometimes to do things in a standard way. Uh, so one of the starting points I always use with a new team is uh, is test driven development. Because I think test-driven development allows them allows people to think about outcomes and usage as they're coding, and not just you know what does the code do. <coughs> we all know the joke it works on my machine, but I know many uh, developers who are quite happy to have something that they can get through quickly that works. And then when they find that you know then when a problem comes, they're happy to try and fix the problem afterwards, um, because a lot of the time we're focused on the intellectual problem. Uh, a lot of our reward systems as well are, are, you know, are around about hitting milestones and things when actually, uh, you know, the, having a repeatable process, you know, embedding, uh, you, embedding in, in small steps like test-driven development, using, and, uh, you know, using automation um, and having ways of um, using automatic tools to do, uh, you know, a, a degree of kind of further testing is another discipline. So I, I see some of this as a discipline thing that teams don't want to have because they may want the, uh, yeah, they, they may want to use the excuse that management wants it quicker to uh, to just do what they want to do, which is, uh, you know, which is to code on the exciting things they want to code on. <laughs> Maybe a little controversial for this time in the morning. Um, yeah, but it, it's a free talking, so... No yeah, yeah. Need to, to mute the, <coughs> the microphone and uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. have a continued the, the, the talking around this, around that talking and I think Pierre, you want to add more stuff? Yeah, I just want to add that it sounds early for everyone this morning. So it's like, uh, <laughs> what is happening? Uh, now it's, he is just sharing opinions. It's not about seeing the truth or whatever. Um, quality is necessary because Usually what's happening is when you see in a long term, when you're not caring about quality, you will have the proportion of rework is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So meaning the, the development of new stuff is getting slower and slower and slower because your team will start in just fixing old bugs, old system of what technical debt and because of the lack of quality. But in, in the meantime is, um, I, I do believe we have to, uh, quality is just mandatory, is just uh, being, let's say, proud about what you're doing uh, and you're doing well. But the, the main risk I discover in my, in my field of work is that the people out there want to define everything up front to avoid uh, uh, lack of quality or whatever. So they are try to analyze until the end of the universe on all the small details to be sure that we're not, and not going into the code and not reviewing the code at all. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in pure software development. So a lot of configuration management on business process development, something like this. And I'm, I'm very, very, sometimes quite a little bit angry because people are not caring enough about quality. They're talking about big build, but oh, we do behavior driven development, blah, blah, blah. In fact, they don't do it. Then they're speaking about DevOps and they don't do it well. And you say, okay, what's about continuous deployment? So I, I try to, to bring some shock therapy about, so I'm, I'm loving, I'm looking always for the, the, the hardest quote that people start to think about 
how far we can go. When I say, okay, so what is for you agile doing things? Agile is simple. You, you, it's continuous deployment and you're testing in production or you're testing in production. You say, what shocking, testing in production, what nightmare. Yeah, that's the goal. Means if you're able to test in production, means you're caring a lot about the quality of your code. You're caring a lot. You have the tools to, to, of continuous deployment. You already have this set up. And usually you don't even have this. If you think about it, we are 10, 20 years ago, and you still not have automatized testing, proper automatized testing, which is for me just the basics. So for sometimes we are speaking about how to, to move, uh, to travel in another galaxy when people are not just able to take a bicycle and, go, and across the road. So it's, for me, it's terrific. <laughs> I, th I think it's as well, it's what we measure, yeah? So if we go, I, I, I started off in manufacturing with dimming, yeah? Yeah. So the role of management is to stay away, build quality in, uh, you know. Uh, at the moment, I see lots of, I think maybe story points are the problem with Agile at the moment because teams are almost more focused on uh, saying a story is done to get the points, yeah, mm -hmm. than that, than than they are in, uh, you know, and looking at metrics like, you know, bugs in live, which is probably a more important one. Is, is uh, looking on the wrong metrics. They're still behind some kind of nasty virus. It's called management by objective, right? Yeah. You have this virus behind is So even if you're not completely focused, it's bubbling up from, uh, and you can call, call it, I will change the name here now, OKRs. Uh, or you come metrics which are not metrics. Uh, even though I will say quality should not be a metric, should be obvious. So I, I do my, my perspective, the best way of to measure quality is the percentage of rework. If, yeah. I, in, if I have increasing rework, means this slows the team down, so you're not, you know, we're, we're becoming less responsive. And one of the answer is start doing proper job. Then we need people like Alex and Benoit to, to fix this because I'm not able at all. <laughs> I love this measure of quality, um, the proportion of rework, because uh, usually we try to analyze it through the number of bugs or the coverage or things like that. And some, some many measures that can be easily foolish or can fool all the people who look at them. Uh, for sure, it has to be measured some way, I think. Otherwise, it goes in the background and no one takes care of this. I mean, if, if it's not already in the culture. But if you want to change a culture, you have to measure it to make it visible. And um, the percentage of rework is, I feel like it's a good measure. I remember one time trying to to develop something with the with the core developer, I suggested him to to make some tests and to to write it in TDD. He told me, "Oh no, you know, it's a matter of one or two hours." And he was right. He did develop it in two two hours maybe, but after this, it took him three days to fix it. <laughs> and for him, it was I mean, it was it was not a problem. Uh, if companies were able to measure the time they waste by redoing work, I think it would slam their face, actually, many companies. Uh, the thing is, how would, you, how would you measure that? Let's imagine, you know, it has to go through time tracking. The, the problem with this, with this kind of measure is always that it makes more work for the developer. And ex unless they understand very well why and the, sense, the, the meaning of it, um, usually they don't like it. They, they just see it yeah. as more cop policies and managers looking behind the shoulders. So how would you imagine to measure the time of free work? So that's why we have agile coaches and scrum masters, in fact. Because they are not really, they are not uh, no authority in the system. They are not managers. They're just like a team member who is doing the Scrum Master job, who is caring about this. 
So this is putting all these pressures of the metrics away from the developers. We have enough things to do. And, and, and rework is, this is how I handle it with my team. So, uh, so usually we say, okay, we want to merge build and run. So meaning as creating new stuff and uh, supporting the old stuff, which is genuine, right? And, and, and uh, as a scrum master, as an article, I love to measure this, how, what is the percentage of the activities we are, the team is doing uh, just to support old stuff? And what is the percentage of new stuff developed? Doing a sprint, as an example. And, and usually this is not to, to, to put something in, in the team member's shoes. It's more likely for me, I use it with the product now about the product development strategy. Meaning sometimes when your product is very old, let's say your team is developing new stuff, and the team is even though it has to support 10, the 10 latest versions, <laughs> then maybe 90% of your time you're just supporting the 10 old versions uh, and, and having just 10% of time to do new stuff, I say, hey, we have to decommission a lot. We have to say, okay, we stop supporting all these old versions. Yeah. So you have a, a double impact, not only on quality, but measuring the lack of quality gives you two angles. One is about the craftsmanship, how to do it. But usually, most of the case is about a lack of very bad product strategy, meaning we're supporting too much. The te one team has to support too much. So then your team at the beginning is, is a software development team, and very rapidly, you just a service support. You're short services. You're just supporting whatever. And you're losing what? You're losing the, the motivation. And you're losing engagement because they say, OK, what is my difference uh, working in Marseille? Or in Edinburgh, what is my difference with uh, maybe Tata Consulting in Chennai? What, whatever. None. Then the thing is, for many companies, uh, I, I remember one in particular who we did measure that, and when we arrived as coach, they told us, "Okay, we have forty percent of uh, time spent in rework, meaning just fixing bugs," and. It was not so shocking for them. Of course, they, they wanted to reduce that. But what I mean here is, for many people, bugs are normal. And one of my main fight is just to say, no, bugs are not normal. They are not supposed to be here. That's an, an in French, we say anomaly, meaning it's by, I mean, the word by itself means it, means it. it's not normal. It's the same thing in English, anomaly. Anomaly, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I've, I've been coaching a team, um, and at the last retro, they're complaining about the amount of tech debt that they're producing. Um, and as a team, they're discussing it. Um, and the product owner is adamant that they've signed up to a roadmap a year ago, and they need to hit the roadmap. And to hit the roadmap, they create tech debt. So the team insisted that they label the tech debt and they put the tech debt in the backlog. Um, and uh, I, as coach, had an argument with them to say, you're putting things in the backlog that you know, if you've never touched and they just stay there for three years, yeah, it mean nothing. It's absolutely nothing. It's not a backlog item because you're never going to work on the tech debt. Um, and then they had a large discussion about the fact that they wanted to record the tech debt so that they could sell management look at all this tech debt, but never go to management and have that discussion. So it's like, why record it? And here comes the Kanban approach, which is very clever. Uh, when you do a, a proper Kanban, when you make triage, triage meanings uh, you, you have to have a product owner as part of a team. Yeah. He's able to say, if you don't have a good product owner, forget it. You, you will fight against uh, windmills. And, and a product owner came here every Monday and said, okay, that's too old. So all the tickets, all of them 30 days, I don't care. Throw it away. They will come back later. As you, you don't care about the legacy because it's impossible. The problem, usually you have a lot of bugs and you check, you, you're checking the bugs and it's just legacy work. So, 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 so let's, let's use language, right? A bug 
is a non-conformity. Yeah, this is like an anomaly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's bugs that we'll fix, and there's bugs that we won't. Yeah. So the bugs that we fix were serious, and the bugs that we don't fix are tech debt. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a good language. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So if the organization are happy to have a lack of quality, but the teams and the craftsmanship aren't, there's a tension. Yeah, I felt, and I felt as a coach, I was uh, being the the bad person, yeah, the uh, the villain by saying, "Don't put this stuff in the backlog because you'll never look at it." <laughs> but I'm not well, sure. Well, but I'd like it. But I'd like your advice because I, mm -hmm. I I felt bad. The tension comes because the developer make it visible. To yes. me, the technical depth is is not a matter of product owner or management. It's a matter of technique team. I mean, I, I don't have to ask you the permission for doing my job correctly. Because if I do, you, you will always choose the cheapest. And my responsibility as a developer is to make a great job and just to do it. So it's one of my message. Stop asking permission for doing a great job. Just do it. I like stop, it. Stop waiting for time for I don't know what. So... Uh, the the great rewriting of the software to to make it great uh, this yeah. time. I mean, a big part of the responsibility of the situation is because of the developers themselves. Sometimes when I come in a company and have the support of the management, and we start talking with the dev team, they they feel like oh that's great, because when you talk about uh, doing great stuff, pride. I mean, almost everybody likes it. But the things are more complex when we come to reality and they realize that they, they will have to change. Because many developers, I mean, they, they just shoot themselves in the feet. They prevent yes. themselves from doing stuff. I agree. I agree. I agree on think is that... But you, you know, there's that too. The the thing is that um, you hear that with that story with legacy code and so on. And but let's say I have a proper definition of legacy code. Legacy it's mean there were there's a gap between what we agree at the moment we did the product and what had been delivered. So a product that been de uh, delivered, let's say, 20 years ago in C, in C and respected what had been agreed, the quality had been agreed, then there's no legacy code. Legacy. It's not a legacy code. It's just that been agreed to be that quality. And the only problem is that we didn't follow the technology. We didn't uh, upgrade the product. That was the problem. Uh, but then... Why you need to upgrade a product that is fine, that you don't need to add more value on inside, and it's working and it's running for 20 years, what's the point to upgrade? It is, there is no point. And I, I like the work that had been uh, made by Adam Tonin. I don't know if you, you read the book, uh, Your Code as a Crime Scene. You say it's really no, it sounds it sounds like a good book. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good book. It's a good book, yeah. And and he say uh, we should if we want to rework, we should look mostly on piece of code where there are many people coding in the same part. Yeah. And today it's a lot of people. So that place have more much more risk to have uh, defect, yes. technical depth than anything else. Now this could be a design problem rather than a code problem. Yes, yes. So this is the part where we should look for the rework. The other place where you have maybe one person that working on that part and included, it's let's say two years, no one touch it. That's not a place to go to work. And, and today, I think the problem is that um, most of the dev some of developers, when they, they want to rework, they want to rework the full product. When they see a yes. product that is 10 years old, they say, oh, we need to rework this one. Say, yeah. Why do you want to rework this? 
Do you know that you're responsible on the production? That's the main responsibility of any developers. We are responsible of the production. So this is this. If you're responsible of the production, then we have another problem. Why all these managers doesn't allow the team to do its job? And it's what Benoit say. We should have no, no need to ask any um, authorization on uh, to make our, our work. If we feel that for the production we need to rework one piece of the code, we should do it. We should not ask permission for this. Yeah, sure. It's not on. But maybe you are, you have a context issue. Uh, it's context issue. a context issue. There's too much managers, uh, uh, people from outside of the system that say to the team how they need to work. And yeah. that's, that's one, one first problem. That's one of Devon's 14 points, isn't it? Management needs to stay out. And yeah. I see that. And I see <laughs> when I am coming to coach teams, uh, when company ask me to say, oh, we have a problem of quality and so on and so on. Um, you say, yeah, okay. And then at the end, where you're coaching mostly, it's the management, not the teams. You need to coach the teams too. But the management need to be coached to, to they understand that what they implicate on the system, what all the, the stuff they're doing from outside the system, of the, the team, the team system, it's making that bad quality included. So, so uh, you're saying, if I turn a little bit uh, down your quote here, uh, is the best coaching uh, contract maybe is when you're hired by the team to help them to be best quality. Am I right? No. But no. The thing that I say even if it's the management that hire me as a coach to, to help on the quality, at the end, it's most of the time, it's not just the problem in the team part, but it's to with the management. It's good that the management see there's a problem of quality, we need to improve the quality, we need to improve the team and so on and so on. But you need to look on the on their garden too. Yeah. But if if you get called in by the management to fix the fix the quality of the team, usually there's a cultural issue there and uh yes. and a distrust. Yeah. There's a tension already between the 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 team system and the outside of the systems. There's already the tension there. Yeah, I, I did a when job interview. Inside, when you look inside, uh, uh, there's a team I look at, I work at with them uh, a few a few months, and and when they call me, I look it inside, I look in the code, and I think the team will show me the things, and I watch it, and I say, okay, how old is the product? How old is the person, the oldest person in this product? And the product had something like 10 years. The oldest people that was on the product was two years. And you say, okay, we have already a problem here because they don't know everything. The oldest part of the product, they have no clue on how it's working. And then when the management is asking for um, adding a value on somewhere where they never put their fingers, of course, the team say, Okay, we need a lot of time for doing this because we have no clue on how it's doing. And it's not going to take uh, just two days for making this. And so is this... Hear the yeah. management say, oh, you shit, you, uh, we're going to hire so a company outside, they will do this in 10 days, it's going to be easy. Yeah, from, from, un uh, from scratch, yes, it's going to take 10 days. But from the product, the existing product, it will take much more of this. Yeah. Two things come to mind. Um, one is, uh, with good discipline and things like TDD, code is easier to maintain because yeah. you can understand it. And yeah. you don't need to be the person that wrote the code to understand it. And one of the biggest problems we have is when we go quickly and we do shorthands, even, in, even some of the things I do with teams are even go back to naming conventions. So what are you naming things so that someone in a, you know, in 10 years time can understand what you wrote, you know, rather than calling, you know, variable A, E and variable A, B, <laughs> you yeah, know, every, every explicit every. naming, things like this. Yeah. 
the first things I'm doing when I'm, I'm looking on a code, I look on the testing folder, the unit. Yeah. To but these, how, but these are these are baby baby things. Wow, I'm gonna, these are baby things. Baby things. Every developer yeah. should know these. Yes, yeah. Benoit. Yeah, what what just strikes me a bit is it seems obvious to you, to Pierre and Scott, that this kind of practice is. I mean, it's a basic. Uh, Pierre talked about uh, driving a, a, mod, a bicycle before going to the moon. And Scott is telling us, okay, we, if everyone is doing baby stuff like TDD, we, the world would be much better. And I agree. What strikes me is why does it feel so evident for us? And, is it, and why is it so far away from many of the companies we are coaching? I, I have this. I have this. Okay. Alistair Coburn told me this one. Oh, no, it wasn't Alistair. It was, uh, it was uh, Robert Martin. Yeah, Bob Martin, Uncle Bob. Um, our industry has been doubling every two years. Yeah. So we start, let's say we start off with uh, 10,000 people in the industry. In two years, we have 20,000 people in the industry. And then four years, we have, uh, you know, again, doubling up. You know, we've now got 400,000. Okay. So basically, everyone in the industry is brand new to it. And everyone in the industry is coming across things at, you know, at first principle time. So almost like, you know, 80% of the industry at any one time has only really been in this for a short time and, uh, you know, hasn't really had, like, you know, some of the, the deep roots. When, when I learned to code, I did four years of university on basic coding. And uh, I know from my age, I'm a COBOL programmer. So I look at, I look at code and I think I used to, uh, these basics, we, you know, it doesn't matter what your language was. Some of these basic constructs about uh, you know uh, read readability, usability, changeability, and that are, are not taught. And many people come in and uh, and they're just brand new because of the the constant growth all the time. This is what I think. So what you say is the the growth is so big that people coming in don't have the time to to get trained correctly. Yeah, and we use things like we come up with. Java and complicated languages and that that often the how we use the language becomes the problem and not the basics and nobody teaches the basics um, because we're trying to understand you know how to use Java classes and things well I, I will go even further I think that the point today is not even how we use Java but more like what is the new coolest framework that we can use to make this project so at least if many <laughs> developers were focusing on the language, I mean, that we, we would have a starting point. But I feel like uh, many developers even almost forget about the language itself and are, most, are so focused on the, the framework. Of course, it brings a lot. A framework is great. Yeah. And there's no point of using them. My, my point is just to say, stop, stop focusing only on this. Of course, you have to know it. You have, you have to know the paradigm that how behind your 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 framework. But first, try to understand your language. I, yeah. I don't know what you. Feel about. you're completely right. But I, I just was thinking because I have this same reflection on, on my field. And until my daughter, youngest daughter, tell me, hey, "Daddy, uh, remember when you were twenty? What are you talking about?" Uh, new cool stuff and who was the grumpy old guy who's pissing you off the guy thinking about think about what you're doing you you got me you become the grumpy old fucking yeah, yeah, guy. But, <laughs> yeah, for, for a few minutes i was thinking oh it looks like an old grandpa discussion about it was cooler before things were better in in our young age but, to be honest it wasn't cool it was it's much cooler now i do believe really I feel like it's easier today. There are so much resources available, so the much great resources. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I was uh, young, when I was 20, I was dreaming about the XP team in Paris. I was, um, comment dit bavé en anglais? Uh, uh, I was, comment dit bavé? You, you could see. Uh, the waters they go, go down. <laughs> yeah. Mouth. When I was looking at the, the 
Kata and the dojo that were being done about TDD. And all I had was a book to train myself because I was not living in Paris. I, I couldn't talk about it to anyone when I was talking about it to, to the schools. They were looking at me like an alien. And I, was to, I had to, to learn it by myself. Yeah. No, you have tons of resources to make it so easily available. So Because yeah, you're, not, right. part, you're yeah. not part of the noblesse, Benoit. You're not part of the noblesse of Paris. You no. didn't make the Grand École and, the, and all the fame. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, no. I'm kidding. But look, look, okay, so, so look at the size of the industry, okay? So there's some, there were probably something like um, 30,000 developers in Scotland, okay? And we run uh, Codecraft, yeah? And about 30 of them turn up. <laughs> you know, the Codecraft group is an amazing group where people can come along and learn, learn from great developers and things, but nobody comes, yeah? A fraction come. I think it's a theme in France. I mean, um, I see that these kind of groups are always really tiny. And one of my goal with Artisan Developer was to, to make it more visible. I think that our movement um, has a big lack of uh, communication and to make it uh, understandable. Most crafters talk to crafters. They are not talking to regular developers who don't really care about that. So if nobody explains them the value of it and why it's important, well, crafters just keep talking to each other. Uh, we don't grow at the movement. But is that that bad? Because if, you, if you're honest, even, even the Arger community, even if the Arger community is going so big, in fact, we are not speaking to everyone. Uh, Uh, you, you're all, always the alien of somebody else. Well, my, my, my problem is um, this kind of practice, the way we think as a crafter um, in a team, if you don't reach a minimum, a minimal mass of people who think the way you do, who, who do the same techniques, you just can't use them. I mean, if you are alone in the team doing TDD, for example, and you are the only one and you have six, six other mates that don't and keep breaking your test and doing shit, well, you won't last long in this team. Yeah, I'll give you uh, just a small recommendation. Have more Russian people in your teams. <laughs> 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 Because you're talking about discipline and you're in Marseille, France, Okay, for the foreign people, you say Fr France is quite revolutionary, but if you want the top of revolutionaries in, in France is Marseille. <laughs> well, I feel like it, 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 I'm, I'm not sure this is so located in Marseille. I feel this in, in many places. Actually. Yeah, I'm kidding. It's everywhere. It's unfortunately everywhere. And unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's like that. I, I saw many people. I had a colleague first. He, I bring him in the in the crafts. Uh, I bring him to London to see Uncle Bob and uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, it was super interesting. It's okay. Let's do it together. We're gonna uh, bring craftsmanship around Switzerland and like this. And then he did his first mission, and the team just show him the door, and he was broke. And he was broke because he bring things. He tried to bring, and I think. And I see so many people that from the craftsmanship community that been, um, yeah, say just the team explain to him, here is the door, just don't disturb us. We focus on creating value. You just make us slow down. We, we slow down. We're writing a lot of line of code to delete after. What's the point? We create directly the correct code. We faster. And that's the problem. Teams, people try to be fast developers, but they don't understand what it means fast. Fast doesn't mean you write the proper code immediately. It, it means you don't have defects, you have a better quality, so you don't pass much of your time logging, debugging to be faster. And that's one, one of the main issues, I think. I have a yeah. question to you. Is that not maybe because we made a big mistake 
accepting to to call this a software factory for yeah. mass production yeah but factory yeah, I, I hate that name to me the factory is means industry and to me where i i feel like my my work is an art and artisan means is is a clear opposition to industry so cathedral builder you take time to build kind, kind a great of, yeah. yeah it's yes and and the thing so i'm i'm coming in the other area so i try to explain what is necessary and i say you can't make start a factory without having the first prototypes prototyping is the main thing is what we call the development phase is like prototyping we don't know where to go and we will discover after and once the prototype is done then maybe you can ask okay can i reproduce this and 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 before everything has been designed with a product life cycle making we were waiting at the end of development then we go in production because in production this is where we make the cash and the big challenge of agile when you put the money on the table is it, the problem is you have to make the cash in the development phase that's the, the big, the, big the problem with, the problem with agile is the is the book twice the work and half the time and then everyone says Where's twice the work and half the time? It was on the book. That's what you sold me. This is the problem. Um, I, I think there's something different about software development than, say, a woodworking. So let's say I was a woodworking artist. As someone who buys the wood, I can feel it, I can touch it, I can see the quality. But a lot of the craftsmanship in software development is invisible. So good code and bad code can look exactly the same. Yeah, for someone who, who doesn't know anything to code. Yeah, you're right, definitely. Yeah. And that's one major issue. There, there is one other big difference with the piece of wood you can have in your hand is that when you have it in your room, well, your piece of wood won't change. Whereas the piece of software, when you, make, when you update it, everyone gets updated. It's like, it's like if your piece of wood in your, in your room, in your kitchen, for example, and while the developers in the factory keeps updating it, it updates in your own kitchen. And yes. with, the, with the real world, it's impossible. But with software, that's what happens all the time. And sometimes I feel like people in our industry don't understand the deep nature of what we do, what, what, of our material, which is not physical. So people say, okay, it's intellectual property. Yeah, that's right. It's some sort of intellectual property. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it's physical. It's electron in somewhere in the world yep. moving. And while they are moving, it updates everyone's life. And that is something that only a few people understand, I feel. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking is so uh, from your your quote, Benoit. I got a couple of ideas. Is it maybe you need to have two uh, two spectrums? One is the pure craftsmanship, and the second is you have to build nanites. So, uh, as a, a science fiction fan, I love nanites. The nanites coming like a virus, fixing all the issues. The guy who creates nanites for code. Will be the great one. What, what is a nanite for you? I, I'm not trying to understand. Uh, a nanite is something you, you like a virus you put in your code. Is uh, a von, uh, like a von Neumann machine? Yeah, it's a very small drones that come to your code and fix what you you mess. Well, the day we are able to do this, we, we don't even need to, to code anymore. Just let, the, yeah. let it do it. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, you, because you will, you will still have people doing sloppy code, right? Because they want to get cheap things. It's like having a celebration and you buy all your wine at Aldi's or Lidl for good wine. So for French guys, it's just not impossible. You can't buy wine there. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, you, what you just said is very, very, very interesting because once again, in the real world, the price is related to the embedded quality. Oh. If you want some good piece of steel, uh, you have to pay it 
a more a more expensive price than a bad quality stuff. Yep. If you want a good quality car, it's more expensive. What's funny is that in our world, that's the opposite. <laughs> yes. Good quality is cheaper. Ah, uh, this is yeah. This this is because yeah, everyone still thinks of us as a cost center and not a value creator. A profit center. You have to put the term yeah. because. Yeah. Unfortunately, money is still the measure. Uh, like yeah. you have a great idea. If nobody buys your idea, your idea is, is a bad idea. So all, most of my ideas are bad ideas because nobody, it's only me are using it. But it's how it is. Is it log make it sense? I don't believe it makes sense. You have to think this is long term and then you have short term. Now we have to think short term is, the problem is you do a lot of, uh, bad things and there's a huge impact having bad craftsmen. Uh, I'm, I'm a big supporter of it because it gives me the real information about how the product, how the service is, is behaving. And sometimes people can come and say, oh, now let's do now. Uh, every year you have a launch of a new uh, process improvement project costing billions of euros which brings no value at all because they have just 20 years of uh, process legacies. And, and, and from the quality, if you have bad quality, you have always two options. One is starting doing the proper quality and the commission, the old stuff, which is a product strategy. So we need craftsmanship, the quality, to give us the information about the product life cycle of the, or the service life cycle of what we are doing from a strategic perspective. But because nobody cares about craftsmanship or quality work, and there is no longer product strategies in companies, it's just running away, or, or it's just a cost center. So what you say is because of short-term vision, product strategy goes to the trash? Uh, there is no product strategy at all. Because if you think, we, we had a conversation last week with G.B. Reinsberger, and, and he came with a very good point about uh, when Agile is cash flow, is doing rapid cash flow because you need to take a decision. So you need to do this, you have to take a decision. Okay, is it okay to deliver something far with bad quality or should we deliver something small with great quality? Well, once again, I don't think this kind of dilemma has to, has to, be, has to be. Why don't we go fast with good quality First, I mean, it's, it's possible. There's something called a human being ego. <laughs> well, I think more about ignorance. And once again, the, the real world has too much of impact on our vision, on our perception of, uh, of code and software. But if we know how to do good quality by design and from day one, it's much cheaper. What costs a lot and what usually people are not ready to do is to invest time, money, and efforts for that. But for, I'm, I'm really convinced of that. It's not point of short-term or long-term vision. Good quality brings an ROI return on investment on day one. Absolutely. After the first hour of work, you start earning um, and uh, I mean, uh, gaining time and go faster with good quality. But once again, the issue is the developers have to know how to do it. And here comes the ego in the, in the equation. And that's a problem. Yeah, mo most developers are male. Most men won't stop and ask for help. <laughs> and the worst are the ones who are experienced. And yeah. After, after 10 years, I mean, the, the guy, many people think they are good. And in particular, if the context you worked in told you that they were, you were good, you start believing it. Same problem with coaches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same problem in both worlds. Yeah. It's human, you know. Um, the thing is, have to, you have to deal with it. And uh, I, I'm getting off quite often angry for the same reasons. <coughs> Then I say, okay, what is the part of myself which I think angry is? It? Oh, you have to oversell. Oh, nobody see how genius I am. 
this, then I have to uh, five minutes. I said, how should they do? And is that does it really matter? It's just about my ego then too. So uh, and here is just to see. You know, the core of art is really about continuous improvement and seeing the position, and and bringing something like craftsmanship. I do believe is giving some light. Like, hey guys, you're doing code. Be proud of what you're doing. And if you do this code for yourself, would you be happy having this kind of code here? Uh, or do you just want to investigate like a crazy inventor? Or you're just doing research and development? Are we doing research and development? Or do we, are we doing development? Which are two different things. I remember that we, we had um, um, an exchange, but it was a writing exchange. Uh, in one of the Benoit posts uh, that he did, I think it was on LinkedIn or, or on his website. I don't remember exactly, but um, we had each, we had a, a lot of talking with people. Were saying that uh, it was uh, it was costing too much money to do bad, good, nice code because <laughs> when we need to be fast, we want to deliver fast on the market because we are a startup. Uh, we have no time to do the quality. And, and I think the, the, the thing is that the people uh, have very short thinking. They just look on today, on, on the minute they call in the stuff. And let, uh, let's say I agree with them if their code they were producing, it was for a software that they will use just one hour. I say, okay, yeah, I agree with you. You can do it like this because you just have a lifetime of one hour. No problem on this. But the software we're building, it's not, the lifetime is not one hour. It's much more than this. And the impact of you not well-crafted product, we have incidents in the future. And for example, last year, uh, Ron Jeffrey, came out with a, with a code It say, the problem of today is that most of the developers doesn't see the incident of their choice in the future. Uh, Alberto Brandolini at the last, uh, last year uh, Craftsmanship Conference in London say something quite similar on this. He said the problem too is that the developers, the life of the developers in a project are shorter than the time where we see the impact of that choice. And it's true, you, you see a lot of developers, they work project oriented, still working on a project oriented. So they do the project fast, 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 bad quality. But who's gonna take care of the maintenance? Not them. So it's not an issue with delivering fast. And that's the business model that they come out with project and maintenance, it's a problem. I, I'm a big advocate when I come to the company and I say, no, you should not, you should stop thinking that you have a team for maintenance and one, one team for the, for the project. It should be a project, yeah. a, um, a product. A project is just the beginning of the life of, a, of your product or a piece of improvement on your product. So instead of this, instead of thinking just project, you think product, one team working on. So if you see that already when you see in a company, when you see people that are working a lot with the maintenance and they're working on products that are already existing, they're struggling and they try to find a way to improve the quality because if they improve the quality, then they have less struggling on bug fixing and more on adding value. And when you see a team that are just oriented projects, they're just thinking of today and not tomorrow. And that's an issue. So I think Agile can bring something if it's what is good. It, the way we bring it is good. When we start to have more team that are product oriented, how it can be? I don't know, me, if I'm a developer in a product, I'm not gonna make shit on my code because tomorrow I'm gonna be the one to clean my shit. Yes. This is the problem. This is the, uh, yeah. code, code, code like you're, code like you're going to support the code. <laughs> yes. And there's, there's also a big misunderstanding what the project is. So you're right. Is a project is a slice of a product life cycle. That's correct. And every everything, uh, but the pro a project is at just is a baking a product in a process. 
to make the product is making a product and at the beginning you have a project and then the project is become bigger it's called a program and the program you will have the new developments and the maintenance and the support from the, the the beginning from the birth until the death of the product and this is caring this is called program management and when you and and, and you have I, I think the agile community is going that way uh, it, it is quite good it's not new stuff but it's okay it's good old stuff that still work makes sense but in fact what i discover is they are using the excuse of project to allocate budgets meaning so we spend a lot of budget in analyzing doing the cool stuff with the experts then a little bit less in the execution phase when you do the, you're creating the thing and then you hand over to a low wage countries for uh, testing and and making live stuff but the problem is the mess is bubbling up there and I always make everything late because that never took care about the quality. So I have a lot of projects say, okay, now the development phase is done. Coach, you can go home because we're going to support this. May I recommend to stay because the mess will start tomorrow. <laughs> and in fact, the mess started tomorrow, the next day, because even though the, the, the low wage country we are not able to down have the knowledge to fix the issues, and you have to take care that the people not, uh, who are developing the solution don't leave the project to move in another project. So that won't be available any longer. So because the knowledge is never in the project, it's always in the people. So what is the main reason is if you want to be as efficient as possible, you have to keep this from the beginning until the end, everyone on the same page. Everyone on, from the beginning until the end, maybe the, not only the same team, but the same knowledge in the team. It's like when you say, uh, if I measure how all the guys are in the system, if the guy is two, and the oldest guy in, this, in the development team is just two years in the system, you don't understand why you should sh uh, shoot or skip out the old legacy. There's no knowledge. And it's just, here is just managing costs. I think that that's the nightmare. Managing costs is caring about nothing, just the budget in very short term because the next year the management has moved away in another project they re renamed the, the the project or the program have something else giving the feeling that you delivered a program in fact you didn't, didn't deliver nothing and it's running away and that's that's a nightmare that's pissed everyone everyone off okay everyone um the last words for everyone because we are already 9 a.m uh, a may recommend last word for benoit because he was invited <laughs> Let's go. Um, d just one thinking. You talked about the this split between the team who develops and the one who support it. Uh, I found a, a vicious effect of this, which is the support team when they start improving quality, when they start fixing bugs and bringing embedded quality into the product. Well, they sometimes they ask me well if we bring so much of quality what will our job become because they they are hired to fix stuff if there is nothing to fix what is becoming their job and that's um sometimes i'm i'm thinking oh shit <laughs> uh, no um it was there is a big strategy in big companies now what they call building build and build and run run is the maintenance team yeah. it was merging because usually you have two functional silos with two different budgets meaning a lot of politics and we have to merge is that even the support team the shared services which are usually abroad we have to merge them so meaning you have uh, the team is handling over all the whole life cycle of a product mm -hmm. It's not having a service level one, two, three, so giving away to somebody else and just spending a lot of time just to share the knowledge. The knowledge is already in the team. You can use pair programming so, so people get trained on it. Maybe your team is becoming bigger. Maybe you will have sub-teams, but you're still around the same hive or the same group of people working together. So the knowledge is always very close to you. It's not far away. Yeah, but I understand what Benoit has said. But the, the yeah, the, the the problem is that uh, the different life uh, team in the life cycle of a product they have a different goal. 
the one working on a project have a goal to deliver as fast as possible the product so we can make so they can make a lot of money um, the one in the maintenance it's we're going to keep the product as long as possible until if we can maintain the product fixing box and so on we have a continuous job together and so it's different goals the maintenance is a great deal. That's a big consulting companies are making a lot of money with maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's com company that are making a lot of money because of this business model. You do a product, you do a project super fast with minimum quality, enough to pass the quality gate of the customer. And then you have the big contract with the maintenance. That's the place where you take a lot of money because you're going to put a lot of juniors developers there to do the maintenance because they are cheaper and we're going to get a lot of money That's and good. and i think today it's mostly the customers that start to need should start to think about the business model and say why we don't put immediately the good developers the one that are making the product in the good quality so the the support part is the cheapest part of the product not the project because you can't sell it because you have to, if you want to sell it, you have to, if you want to get the contract, you have to be the cheapest. You on the, you on the side, you are thinking on the side of the company selling this kind of this business is, model. The, 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 this is on the side of the customers. The customer should change too. This, yeah. is this is exactly the same conversation I had 35 years ago at the first project we had. <laughs> but nothing changes. Nothing changes. <laughs> But the craftsmanship, the craftsmanship community came out uh, from the observation that nothing changes. We had in 2001, we have Agile Manifesto come out and everything, and we should have improvement. But seven we years have, after, we have Agile and yeah. we had the observation that nothing changes. We're yeah. still doing the same crappy code. We, st we don't have professional. I remember the first time we heard about how it is the software development uh, in France, a lot of coach, I remember in Paris, we were a lot of coach and we were, wow, in France, a software developer, it's just a working person, nothing else. That the only way to be uh, respected is to become a manager. I say, come on. And I remember uh, a friend uh, in Paris, Pierre Canel, that was the co-founder of, uh, of um, uh, InfoQ France. Um, he, he had uh, a, a research he did for the government, the French government, is asked where are, who are our best software developers in France? And he came out, yes, we have the best, but they're living outside France. In Tunisia and Morocco. We need to keep them in France, not making them run away. True. Okay. Uh, can you say, Benoit, uh, that the best developers in France are coming from Tunisia and Morocco? Well, I'm, I'm not sure this is... Um, no, this is provocation. This is, yeah, this is political. Okay. And I'm not sure this is a <laughs> way of handling it. I, 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 don't, I don't know if humor is still allowed in this kind of discussion. So. Oh, you, always, it's always, always. always. <laughs> and you have to be also um, um, uh, very playful and, and you have to have a special kind of humor. My humor is very special. Sometimes it's like... <laughs> Yeah, you are very, you are very special. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for the discussion. It was a great time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Benoit. Thank you, Scott, for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Take care. Have a, have Take a great care. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.